many of you love to be in the house of God? Make some noise. Come on. Woo! You know, last week we had a very exciting weekend. We had our Spotify. How many of you, you enjoy Spotify? Make some noise. Come on. Woo! You know, we had 309 friends who joined us for Spotify. And out of that, we had about 110 friends who joined us here at the service. And in total, we had about 39 decisions. Come on, can we just praise the Lord? Hallelujah. Woo! You know, I believe Spotify is a great uh, event to just uh, bond with our friends. And you know what's an interesting thing when I was there? We were really praying hard, you know. Every time in August, it's always like a rainy season. And I remember when I was there, we just keep praying. And I remember Pastor Roland, he was at the, at the uh, captain's ball court right on the rooftop, right? And you can see after that, he chowed up. But basically, we were really, all the, the, all the pastors and the ministry staff, we were praying that there won't be rain. And you know what's an interesting thing? When I was just driving, okay, to, towards the expressway, I saw that there was a very clear line, okay? That side was raining, and this side where SUTD was, wasn't raining. I think God is amazing. Can we just praise the Lord for giving us great weather? And, and I believe that as we end off at the Spotify, it was really the season of the One Sermon series. And I believe that you'll remember what Pastor Mel shared when she kicked off the entire sermon series. She talked about what really matters. And what really matters to God is lost souls. It's every life is precious to God. And that's why basically in the entire, sermon, entire, entire season of this sermon series, we want every one of us to bring the gospel to our friends. You know, when we hear the word gospel, and we say that we must preach and share the gospel, what does it really mean? How many of you know what is the gospel? Very clearly, one. put up your hands. How many of you, not so clear one? Maybe, probably, even 90% you think that you're clear. If you're not so clear, put up your hands. Wow, eh, then, then, then what are you doing here? <laughs> but I want you to know this. Okay? Every time we hear about this word gospel, the definition of the gospel is simply God's good news. Say with me, the gospel. God's good news. You know, we often think about the gospel, about Jesus and how He would die for us on the cross. And that was exactly what I preached last Saturday. Well, that's not wrong. It's not right either. And that's, that's actually a limited understanding of what the gospel actually is. Think about it. If it's only the gospel of the cross or the gospel of Jesus or gospel about Jesus, then how did G Jesus preach that message? To us, we often use John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His own, one and only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. And we often use that, John 3, 16, to share the gospel. But when Jesus shared John 3, 16, it couldn't really be understood. Why? Because Jesus had died for us yet. Yet Jesus preached a gospel. So what gospel did He preach? Let's look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. Okay, let's just read it together. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases among the people. You see, in this passage, many people claim that Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom was simply a message about overthrowing the current evil government at that time. But it is not so. The gospel of Jesus is really the gospel of the kingdom. And this is a message that I have for you today. It is entitled, The Gospel of the Kingdom. Say with me, The Gospel of the Kingdom. I believe this is foundational in our faith. If we really understand what is the gospel of the kingdom, I can tell you, the way that you see the Bible, the way that you see the world will be entirely changed. And this will also prepare us for the upcoming G12 Asia Conference. Okay? And how many of you are going for the Asia G12 Asia Conference? Make some noise. Come on. I believe we are all excited for it. And you all know what is the theme of the conference? Your kingdom come. And Jesus spoke about the kingdom of God more than any topic. And the kingdom of God simply means this, the reign of God. Say with me, the reign of God. Or you can say it's the rule of God. 
And the reign of God is simply where God exercises His dominion, His sovereignty, His influence, His power. And that is God's kingdom. In Psalms 22 verse 28, it says, For the kingdom is the Lord's, and He rules over the nations. Psalms 103 verse 19, The Lord has established His kingdom in heaven, and His kingdom rules over all. God is indeed the king over all. He rules and reigns over earth. He rules over us. How many of you can say an amen to that? And let us, let us really remember that when we talk about the kingdom of God, we are really talking about the king that reigns over our lives. Can we just look at this key scripture that I want to bring you all to in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 to 10. Okay, can we read it aloud together? Okay? One, two, three. In this manner, therefore pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Can we just look to the Lord in prayer? Father, we just want to welcome you. And Lord, we want to declare that today that the kingdom of God come and be established in our hearts. That Lord, that you open our spiritual eyes, you open our spiritual ears to really understand what the kingdom of God is all about and what the gospel, the good news of the kingdom is all about. And I declare that today, there will be a change in our worldview. There will be a change, Lord, that will just cause us, Lord, to fall deeper in love with you. So, Lord, we want to commit this time into your hands. I pray even for our friends who are here with us. I ask that, Lord, that today is the day of salvation. I pray that you open their spiritual eyes to know you as well. Thank you, Lord. We welcome your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. Say with me, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come. Hey, can we say it louder? Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus, in this passage, he was demonstrating how prayer should be. And this is how he prayed as well. And that's why we call this passage the Lord's Prayer. And the Lord's Prayer didn't start off with us repenting, start off with us asking the Lord for our needs. It didn't start off with us forgiving others. But the Lord's Prayer started off with praying for the kingdom of God to be established on earth. And Jesus is essentially telling us that to pray to God, to exercise His authority and His power, in this world, so that His purposes and plans are accomplished in and through His people. Jesus Himself prayed in such a manner. Why? Because that is upon His heart. And, and that is what He really wants. He wants every one of us, His people, His disciples, people in His kingdom, to build His kingdom here on earth. And today, we want to explore this question. And we, and we want to understand why is it important to build the kingdom of God here on earth why today I want to show you two truths why is it important to build the kingdom of God here on earth it is important because it is all about transformation of lives say with me transformation of lives now I want you to understand this the gospel of the kingdom is more than the gospel of salvation Though gospel of salvation is part of the gospel of the kingdom, you see, we tell people about the good news of Jesus Christ. You know, in church, we count the attendance. You know, we ensure, we count even the attendance in your cell group and, and attendance here in the services here in Teens Excite, the main services. But I want you to know this. Jesus did not come to merely give us a ticket to heaven. He came to bring us even more than, the, than salvation. He came to give us the kingdom of God on earth. You see, the church does not exist for heaven, but for earth. Note this down. The church exists for earth. It did not exist for heaven. Can you imagine if we exist for heaven, do you know what does that mean or not? The moment you lift up your hands, boom, you're teleported to heaven. If this is so, if we just say the sinner's prayer, every one of us will just disappear and we go to heaven. Am I correct? If, if this is God's purpose to create us to exist for heaven, then I don't think there is even an earth. 
That's why I want you to understand that the church does not exist for heaven. It exists for earth. And I want you to know this. There are many, I know there are many churches out there. There are many Christians out there that to them, the good news, the gospel is waiting for them in heaven until they will receive this good news when they die. But isn't it, isn't it sad? They're missing out on God's life here on earth. The gospel of the kingdom is never about heaven. The gospel of the kingdom is never about life after death. It's about our lives here on earth. And the gospel of the kingdom is not just a touch from heaven, but it is, but it is a result of us being transformed in our lives. How many of you can say an amen to that? You see, Jesus launched His public ministry announcing the gospel. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, He says this, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. If you see the word kingdom of heaven is similar, it's the same as kingdom of God, because in the book of Matthew, He was trying to be sensitive to His audience. That's why He said kingdom of heaven. Yet it means the same thing. And when we hear the word repent, what comes into your mind? Oh, Lord, forgive me. Ah, why is it so stupid? Why do I do this kind of thing? Why I sin against the Lord? Then you know, hey, like, ah, bang, bang, bang. And you cry. You cry buckets. I know some of us, we feel like this, you know, when we sin against God. But that is not what repent actually means. Here, the word repent, is, it means to rethink, to turn around in view of a better opportunity. And what Jesus is essentially saying in this verse, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. It simply means this. Hey, hello. You know, you need to rethink your strategy for life in the light of your opportunity to live your life under God's loving rule in the kingdom of heaven. It simply means this, you know. We are living in the kingdom. It's not in heaven, you know, the kingdom of God. It it exists here on earth. There's a king waiting for us to, to be part of this kingdom. That is why when the Lord says repent, it means we need to realign our lives under His rule and reign. We need to rethink about the way we live our lives. We need to think about it, hey, it does my action reflect God's truth? Does all the things that I'm saying pleases God our King? We really need to start thinking about the way that we live our life here on earth because we live in the kingdom of God. We are under the rule of the king. And a lot of us here, we need to let go of our life. We need to let go of life into the hands of God. Stop trying to, to you know, bargain with God with the way that we live our lives. We need to come under His rulership. We need to submit to His kingship. And be simply because it is God's desire for you to become more and more like Him, to be transformed into His likeness. Let me repeat this again. The gospel of the kingdom is more than the gospel of salvation. It begins with salvation, but it progresses from there to maturity of believers who find their calling and gifting to live as salt and light, to produce fruit for the Lord. And that is what I mean by transformation of our lives. That when we are in the kingdom of God, it is not just that we, our names is written in the, in the book of life. It is also means that as time goes by, when we live under His rule, our lives will be transformed. That's why in Luke chapter 17, verse 20 to 21, okay, can we read the verse together aloud? Once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God will come, Jesus replied, The coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, Here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. The kingdom of God is in your midst. Can you turn to your friend on left and right and say, The kingdom of God is in your midst. What it means is this, The kingdom of God is here. Jesus is not pointing to all His disciples to the people that's following him, to the Pharisee, to some future place. He's trying to tell them that he wants them to live in the reality of the kingdom in, the, in their daily lives. What Jesus is trying to tell us is that, hey, hello, 
The kingdom of God is not in heaven, you know. The kingdom of God is here. Today, you need to know that you can live in this kingdom and can live in the ways of God. How many of you can say an amen to that? And that is why when we learn to live in the kingdom of God, we can live out the transformed life that God wants us to because God is in the business of transforming lives in His kingdom. How many of you can say an amen to that? Let's just look at, just now, let's put up this slide again. Rethink your strategy for your own life. Re think about your own life. Try to realign your life when you, in this kingdom. Why is it? I was just asking the Lord. Why is it that many of us who can be a Christian for so long, but our lives are not transformed? You know why? We insist on our will to be done. You know when Jesus taught us that prayer, that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The, it has to be the will of God in our lives and not our own will because we insist our will to be done. That's why there's no transformation. We want full control of our lives. If you read Romans chapter 12, verse 2, what does the Word of God say? Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. You see, when we live in the kingdom of God, God is our king. It is not about us getting our way. It is not about us insisting that our will be done. God is not an ATM machine. We are transformed by learning the will that is of God that's good and pleasing. You know, we must care more about God's heart and will for our lives, more than we care about our own will. And today we need to recognize that God is the King and we need to submit to His rulership. And when you do that, then can you be transformed. You know, I was just seeking the Lord, I just sense the, the Lord just telling me this, about some of us here. The Lord gave me this word, stubborn. Can you turn to your friend on the left and right and ask, are you stubborn? Are you stubborn, okay? You know, what, what does it mean to be stubborn? It means refuse to move or refuse to change our opinion. And what does this mean when you're stubborn? It means that we think our ways are the best and what is worse is that we think our ways are God's way when actually it is our own ways. And you know what's the worst thing that can happen in our life? Is that when we, when we do not do God's will in our life, when we do not for, allow God to move us into His purposes and plans for our lives. And, and right now, I just want to give you very quickly, okay, I just want to recommend you two ways, okay? You know, often we always say, hey, so what is, my, what is God's will for me in this situation, you know, and things like that. But I just want to share with you two very simple ways to help you, okay, to understand whether the things that you're thinking about is something that is of God, okay? First thing first, you need to run your thoughts through your cell leaders, okay? Why? Because we need to trust that our leaders are people who attempt to follow God with their lives and that they in turn can help us to hear from God. You see, why, why, why is it that we want to talk to our leaders about it? It's really because sometimes we are not aware of the things that we do not know. And in fact, our leaders or even our leaders or even our parents who are Christians or even parents summoned by God's, God's sovereignty can point you to something that, that will just help you in your own walk with God. And therefore, is that so important? To, and through even our leaders, through even our pastors, we are able to hear from God. And that is what is needed in our own personal walk with God to walk according to His will. And the second thing is this. We need to seek out voices of our mature friends, our friends in your cell group who are mature, rather than friends 
who are immature, you know that well, everything they tell you is nonsense. Or even some of our pre-believing friends who, who may not give you the right advice. And, and you know what? It is so important to share and to talk about it so that, so that we, can, we can have this reflecting board in, in our own cell group, in our own spiritual family, so that we can walk according to the will of God. All right? How many of you, you do that? Wave at me. Oh, yeah, don't be shy. I think you're very shy. Huh? But it's okay. I know a lot of us will do that. But I just want to encourage you. If you want to walk according to God's purposes and God's will for your life, speak to your leaders, speak to your friends whom you know are mature in the Lord. All right? And, you know, last week we had our friends who came, right, who made decisions for the Lord. And, and you know what? Last week, they received Christ. Am I correct? They received salvation. But what is it that we need to do to help them to be transformed in the kingdom of God? Remember that we had some things that, that we introduced to all of you. Remember? You all know what is this? Okay? I believe every cell leader and every youth host, okay, you are signed up as a youth host. Okay, youth host, I think there's probably about 100 of you. Okay? This thing, is, okay, this, this material is actually called Life 101. And there's another book called Life Questions. Say with me, Life Questions. And Life 101. Okay, we just look at the Life Questions. If you look at Life Questions, okay, this, this book, okay, the reason why we have this, it's really a follow-up material for you to do with your friends. That's why when you go to them, because after they receive Jesus, they wouldn't know what to do. They wouldn't know what it means to live in the kingdom of God. And that is why when you have these life questions, okay, life questions is for our friends who want to know more about God. And through this, you can lead them to say the sinner's prayer, to lead them to receive Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And if you look at it, the content is very simple. There are just three simple topics in these life questions. It talks about who am I? It talks about identity. It talks about why do I need a saviour? And it, and it also answers the question on who is Jesus Christ. And this is very essential. If you have friends who want to know more about God in your school, go to your cell leader, ask them for this material, okay? And you can bring the kingdom of God to them and show them what it means to, to, be, to, to know Jesus, all right? Then the second, the second book, Life 101, Okay? Life 101 is basically for you to do with your friends who re just received Christ. Okay? And the topics are very simple. How to receive the gift of life talks about understanding God's work and faith. Talks about what is eternal life. And it helps you to teach your friend to read the word, to teach them how to pray. I think this is so essential because we need to help our friends, help our friends to really know how to grow in the Lord and be, and be transformed. Amen? Alright? Why am I telling you all this? It's really because if we want to build the kingdom of God here on earth, we need to start by helping our friends to know more about Jesus. And when we use this you know, to, to consolidate them, to talk to them about the importance of cell group, the importance of, of, of um, being equipped, uh, reading the Bible and things like that. You know, it helps them to understand more so that they can come for life class. I think that is so important. All right? How many of you, are youth hosts here, can you just wave at me, be confident, wave at me? Woo! All right, all right. Yeah, I can, I can see a number of hands. Praise God for you. And that's why I want to encourage you, if you're youth hosts, do bring this to, to share with a friend and help them to know more about God. Amen? Amen. Why is it important to build the kingdom of God here on earth? The first truth. What's the first truth? It is all about transformation of lives. This is so important. That's why I, I mentioned that the gospel of the kingdom is more than the gospel of salvation. It is really about helping about us being transformed in the Lord, living according to His ways. But it is more than just transformation of our lives. The second truth, which is the most important truth, it is all about the transformation of nations. You see, when Jesus came to earth, He came in order to penetrate every kingdom of darkness with His light. He came to bring he healing to sickness. 
replace sadness with joy, feel meaninglessness with a purpose. He came to change things for the better, for a world that has no hope outside of God. And that's why I like what Chuck Colson said. Genuine Christianity is more than a relationship with Jesus as expressed in personal piety, church attendance, Bible studies, and works of charity. It is more than discipleship, more than believing a system of doctrines about God. Genuine Christianity is a way of seeing and comprehending all reality. It is a worldview. And that's what the kingdom of God is all about. We need to see the things that is around us in the light of the kingdom of God, in the light of God's principles for our lives. That's why I want to challenge all of you today. And I want to remind all of us that God wants you and me to bring the kingdom of God into the territory that He's given to you so that His will can be done on earth. So can you please tell me what is the territory that God has given to you? Can someone shout some things? Come on. Your? Your school? Any more? Your family? Any more? Your workplace, if you're working. And even the community that is around you as well. You see, when the gospel of the kingdom comes into lives, when the gospel of kingdom comes into community, society, nations, everything is impacted. That's why the gospel of the kingdom is about societies being changed. It's about cultures being transformed. God is the king of every area of society and He wants to see the nations transformed. And the society transforming message is to be preached and that is the gospel of the kingdom. Can we just clap onto the Lord and just thank Him for this gospel? <laughs> Hallelujah. And I want to say this to you from John Calvin. We must make the invisible kingdom visible in our midst. You see, when, when God comes into our lives, when our lives are being transformed, we cannot be hidden, you know. Do you know that when I had colleagues, when, when I was a teacher, after so many years, then I realized that this, this colleague of mine is a Christian. Then I say, hey, how come? I'm a closet Christian. I say, huh? I didn't know you're, there's such thing called closet Christian because I don't want anyone to know that I'm a Christian. I say, that's, that's very interesting. And as people living in the kingdom of God, we must make the kingdom visible. And what's going to make a difference in the world is the gospel of the kingdom. Because the gospel of the kingdom is the true gospel. If the nations are not transformed by the gospel of the kingdom, Nobody will believe that God is the King. And we have a big part to play in making the kingdom of God visible in this world. That's why you and I all have a part to, to play in establishing the kingdom of God here on earth. And Jesus got it started and we are to carry on His work. Right now, I just want to share with you a story okay, of Lander Cope. She's an author. okay. She's a speaker as well. You know, she wrote this book called The Old Testament Template. And I, I bought this book many years ago in the early 2000s when I was just, um, when she came to preach in FCBC. I want to tell you this, when I, read, when I read this book, it changed my worldview totally. It helped me to understand what is the kingdom of God and how the kingdom of God should look like here on earth. And even in her book, she addresses the issue of the failure of the church to operate from Jesus' paradigm of the gospel of kingdom versus the gospel of salvation. And she believed this is why we had such a little impact in the Western church. And in her opening chapter, tells a story about her sitting in her living room one day watching television when a British journalist began to say that Christians believe that the more Christians are there in the community, the more that the community will be affected for good. And basically, what this journalist is saying this, the greater the Christian presence, then the greater the benefit to the society at large. So the TV journalist went on to describe a research project that was designed to discover is, if this was true. He evaluated that the most Christian city in America, okay, he evaluated this city to see how this influence worked out practically. 
and he defined most Christianized as the community with the largest percentage of church attendance regularly. And that city was Dallas, Texas. He looked at various statistics and studies, including crime, safety on streets, police enforcement, and the justice and penal system. He looked at healthcare hospitals, emergency care, contagious disease, infant mortality rate, and the distribution of caregivers. He reviewed education, equality of schools, safety, test scores, and graduation statistics. Jobs, housing, and general economics were also evaluated. Each of these categories were evaluated using racial and economic factors. Was that equity regardless of colour, creed or income and so on. So by the time the journalist host was done with the conclusions of Dallas st study, Lander Cope was devastated. No one would want to live in a city in that condition. The crime, the ruined social system, the disease, the economic discrepancies, the racial injustice all disqualified this community from having an adequate quality of life. And this was the most Christianized city in America, and Lander Cope wanted to weep. And the host, okay, the journalist in the, in the program, took this devastating picture of a broken community to the Christian leaders and asked for their observations. One by one, each pastor viewed the same facts about the condition of a city with simplicity. The, this journalist is asked, he asked each minister, as a Christian leader, what is your response to the condition of your community? Without exception, in various ways, they all said the same thing. This is not our concern. We are spiritual leaders. Isn't it shocking? It is the most Christianized society. But yet, it is a place where no one People find that it's not a good place to live in because of all the crimes, all the things that is happening, there's, there's a bad social system that is taking place. And this is really scary because there's no transformation taking place in that, in that state, in that society, even though there are so many churches. That's why I like what Martin Luther said. A gospel that does not deal with the issues of the day is not the gospel at all. The gospel that does not deal with the issues of the day is not gospel at all. You see, the gospel of the kingdom deals with all things, including salvation, including reconciliation of all things, including the material world that was lost in the fall. And honestly, it is narrow-minded okay, of any church if you were to focus on salvation only. How should the kingdom of God look like on earth? And I like what this author, okay, his name is Miles Monroe. He wrote this book on the kingdom of God. This is what, she, what he said. A kingdom is a sovereign rulership and governing influence of a king over his territory, impacting it with his will, his intent and his purpose, manifesting a culture and society reflecting the king's nature, values and morals. A kingdom is the governing impact of the king's will over a territory or domain, his influence over people and a government led by a king. You see, if Jesus, if the kingdom of God is really established on earth, if you look at every part of society, you can see Jesus. You can see that the principles that is governing this, this organization or this place is really the principles that comes from the word of God. And that's why this Jesus' desire was for, the God, was for the kingdom of God to be manifested on earth. The kingdom of God is seen on earth when every sector of society manifests kingdom principles. And you can see kingdom values manifested visibly. That's why when Jesus taught the disciples how to pray, that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What Jesus is telling us is this, that we may never be able to see God's kingdom established fully on earth. But Jesus is telling us that we should continue to pray and to ask for it and to expect it to take place in every part of society. And God wants His kingdom expressed through our lives completely. And this includes transformation of the nations. 
If you look at this country called Nigeria, can you know where's Nigeria? Nigeria, okay. Nigeria has 60% of the population who's born again, who's born again as Christians, all right? Yet the culture has one of the greatest problems of crime and corruption of any nation in the world. That is because the gospel of salvation is the primary message. They are only concerned about filling the church with people. And even though that Nigeria is a place where there are great evangelism campaigns, but the effect on the people has been minimal due to their failure to apply the gospel of the kingdom in every area of their life. You contrast this to this, this place called Elmo Longa. Say me, Elmo Longa. Elmo Longa is Guatemala, where 90% of the population, they are Christians. And you know what's the interesting thing about this place? There are no jails. Because they don't need them. Because they effectively apply the gospel to every aspect of their life. Let me read the story of, of El Malonga to you. Okay? El Malonga is a village in Guatemala with an encouraging story of transformation. Before being visited by God's power, it was a place overrun by fear, demons, poverty, idolatry and drunkenness. The main feature was alcohol-induced slumber experienced by many of the inhabitants as a result of serving an idol. This perverse idol was a figure created to connect with the Guatemalans by highlighting the smoking habits, liquor, drinking, and immorality of this creation. How many of you wants to stay in this place? If it's in this state, nobody wants to, right? All right? But God called a humble man. His name is Rizka to fight against the power of darkness found in this village. Because of this man's obedience, people began to experience the liberation and transforming power of Jesus Christ. It has been reported that 90% of the 18,000 inhabitants surrendered their lives to Christ. Since the power of God began to transform the community, the crime has a marked decline. Okay, the police chief testified, currently we usually have 20 to 30 people a month in jail. Before crowds would gather just to witness the nightly drunken fights, the police chief wouldn't have any rest before the community had four prisons and they were not sufficient to accommodate all the prisons. What oh, amazing. And today things are different. People have changed their attitude and the last prison was closed in 1988. Wow, 30 years without a jail. That's amazing. Remodel and it's now called the Hall of Honor. This jail is now called the Hall of Honor, which is a place for weddings, receptions, and community events. And in addition to the decline in crime, a great social change has occurred. There is an absence of prostitutes and bars. The former bars have been converted into small shops with new names such as Little Jerusalem and Jehovah Jireh. Before the intervention of God, most men were alcoholics and their homes were untidy. Neglect and the physical abuse were rampant. It was very common for men to beat their wives, sometimes with sticks. And today, there is more communication between families and abuse has declined. The unemployment, beggars, drunks, sleeping on the sidewalk and other negative things have been declined significantly due to the transformation experience in this village. And also, okay, this is amazing, there has been an economic re renewal, a phenomenon has occurred agriculturally in this village. The salary, cauliflower, cabbage, potatoes, carrots, radishes and other vegetables are incredibly larger in size than those grown in surrounding villages. You look at the picture. The vegetables are so huge, you know. It's amazing. And agriculturalists from United States has visited the location to study the scientific principles that have allowed the production of better crops. The only logical conclusion is that God has blessed their crops and farms of Elma Longa. And today the people are selling vegetables in all Guatemala and exporting them to other nations. The only logical conclusion is that this village has truly experienced the transforming power of God and God has transformed the lives of people, the social influences and the economy of this village. Can we just praise God? Amen. This is the kingdom of God on earth. Can you imagine Singapore has no jail? Can you imagine in your own school, you have no friends who is late for school? Can you imagine in your school, 
there's no bullying. Can you imagine in your own school? There's, there's no nonsense, you know. Everybody is just going to school, simply wanting to glorify God. I think that is amazing. And I want you to know, the reason why God wants to transform lives is because He wants to transform communities, transform societies, and eventually He wants to transform the entire nation and the nations beyond. And the nations is indeed in the heart of God. God wants to use you and I to effect change in our society, our nation, and the nations beyond. I want to say to you this, so that you can remember, God saves us in order to work through us. Say with me, God saves me in order to work through me. How many of you can say an amen to that? Amen. See, Jesus did not save us just to go to heaven. Jesus saves us so that he can use us on earth to build His kingdom. And we must be committed to advance the kingdom in every nation of the world. You know, last Wednesday, okay, you know what day was that, right? 8th of uh, August. How many of you went for the day of His power at the indoor stadium? You all were, were there, right? You know what happened to me? I was locked out. <laughs> hey, don't laugh, don't laugh. Hey, the reason why is because usually for this, right, I will bring my children there, okay? So I reached there before 7.30 and I got the shock of my life that the queue was so long all the way until, you know, that car park near uh, Kalang Sini Leisure, right? And I was saying, oh my, I better go in. You know, you know why? Because all this while, every single year when Day of His Power, okay? When it comes to, when we use City Harvest Church, it's about 6,000 seater. And I know that by 8.30, it'll be closed because it'll be full. Because 6,000. Now thinking, Day of His Power Stadium, indoor stadium should have 10,000. I think no problem. If I, before 7.30, should be okay. Well, the moment I reached there, I got a shock of my life. I well, carry my kid. I see my mother-in-law, my father-in-law trying to get a kid. And I was there. And, you, and we were just down, standing down there, just very, almost reaching, you know. Almost reaching. And I heard that they were giving out tickets to manage the crowd. And there was this guy who was standing beside me, okay? His name, he's one of our staff. His name is Daniel Tan, okay? And I look at him, I say, hey, because he's the one who's in charge of um, Praise Singapore. If you're volunteering to be usher, okay? He's the, he's the man, okay? He's the one in charge. And I was looking at him, I say, hey, bro, this is a rehearsal for you, huh? <laughs> They were just laughing at each other and things like that. Then suddenly, you know what? They say that all locked out is full. Then I'm thinking, oh my, it's, it's all locked out. And I was just thinking, oh, oh like that, how are uh, it's locked out? And I saw Daniel Tan in front. Okay, he's a very tall guy. I say, hey, bro, can you, it's your rehearsal time. Can you tell them to all move or not? So he stand down there. Okay, everybody move. It's close. Wow, just nice uh, for him to rehearse. Then after that, I was just thinking, hey, how about we all go and pray? So I just told, told people around me and say, hey, come, let's go and pray. So in the end, we just went down to the stairs and I just gathered some of the people that I know. I said, hey, why don't we, we, we pray? Okay, though we are locked out. I, honestly, I'm, I don't feel disappointed or discouraged. It's just that my track record gone. Because uh, every year I will attend. But when I was there, I was just, so I just gathered everyone to pray. I just closed my eyes. And, and, and I just let everybody to pray. And we're just singing songs of, of worship. And, and, and when I open my eyes each time, I say, huh, how come God, so many people coming to join us? Then there was one mother, she came with three kids. How else you can go in or not? And I say, what do you think now we're standing here? <laughs> then she said, can I join you on the break? Yes, come. So actually, when I was there, most of the people there are people with kids. So we're down there and praying. The more we pray, the more we worship, people start to join us. If you look at that picture, I was just standing down there at, at, the, at one of the, the posts and we're just praying and and it was just an amazing sight when just gathered so many people to pray and people from all different churches coming together. And, and after, after praying, and people come and thank, hey, thank you for leading. Ah. And I'm like, okay, I can, ah, thank you. But, but you know, after that, whole, after that whole incident, you know what was God speaking to me about? 
this is a picture of revival. And I was just so happy because, wow, the, the indoor stadium is filled. And I think there's definitely you know, a great chance, okay, that our national stadium will be filled as well because people are so eager to come together to pray. And when I was just praying, people just come readily, okay, just to pray along. And I, I could see many pre-believers walking past, wondering what we are doing. And that is really a picture of revival in our nation. And that is the picture that I see that every one of you here, when you go back to your schools to pray. You know that when I talk about effecting change in, in a community or society, you know the first thing that you can do is to effect change in your school. Why don't, you can, why don't you just start off with your class? And when you learn to pray, I can tell you God will move. And God wants to establish His kingdom all over the earth. He wants to establish it wherever you have been placed. How will you respond? Will you respond to the Lord and say that, Lord, I'm willing. Lord, use me to gather my friends to pray in school. Use me, even if I'm the only person to pray in class. Use me. Lord, use me to bring my friend to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Use me, Lord, to help my friend to grow in knowing the King in this kingdom. Can you imagine with me that the kingdom of God is established in your family, in your schools? Can you imagine the kingdom of God established in our nation? That's going to be so amazing. That's why, that's why FCBC, I really thank God that I'm in FCBC because FCBC is a kingdom-driven church. That's why we have the community service arm because we want to engage community, we want to transform community. That's why we have even gateway entertainment because we want to see change in arts and entertainment. That's why we are so involved in Love Singapore because we believe that the kingdom of God can be established here in our nation. I'm just so thankful that I'm in FCBC. And I'm just so thankful that I can be a citizen in the kingdom of God. How many of you, and I'm just saying this, that you're happy to be in FCBC? Just wave at me. Come on. Be proud. Woo! And how many of you are even more joyful to be a citizen in the kingdom of God? Wave at me. Woo! Amen. Praise God. So why is it so important to build the kingdom of God here on earth? It is really all about transforming lives and transforming the nations. And this is the message that I want to bring to you today. And let's, let's be thankful that we are in this nation called Singapore. You know, I was just attending the NDP on, on Thursday. If you look at our nation, Honestly, physically, economically, it's impossible that we exist. But in God's sovereignty, we, we are now where we are because God has called us to be the anti of Asia. And more than that, I want you to know the reason why Singapore is so prosperous is really because that the leaders of our nation, they apply kingdom principles. We follow kingdom principles, kingdom truths to run this entire na nation. And that's why we are such an efficient system, very good organisation. That's why people love to learn from Singapore. And we are always a prototype. That's why you see the announcement, right? Thank God, right? Can you imagine? Can you imagine if Greedy got fire and there's no announcement we have died? I think that's amazing. In other countries, people will have died because there is no announcement. <laughs> this is my thought. And I believe we have friends who are here with us, you know, who have not received Jesus Christ in your life. And I want to share with you, okay, from Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 to 14. This is what the Word of God says. For He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. 
No, dear friends, I want you to know that Jesus Christ has rescued you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom where He rules and He reigns. And today I want to give you an opportunity to enter into this kingdom. And you may be asking, Pastor Gohan, how do I enter into this kingdom of God? No, it's very simple. I'm going to lead you into a time of prayer. And this prayer is designed to help you to receive Jesus Christ into your life. And when you receive Jesus Christ into your life, and when you believe that Jesus Christ died for you on the cross, I can tell you your sins are forgiven, you will receive eternal life, and your name will be written in the book of life. And I want to tell you this, when you receive Jesus Christ in your life, and the Word of God tells us that He will give you a life that is abundant. A life that is abundant means a life that is meaningful and purposeful. And I want to help you to receive Jesus Christ in your life right now. And if you're hearing all that I say, you know that you want to walk out of darkness. Today, you need to decide to enter in the kingdom of God. So I can I just everyone to close our eyes and to bow our heads. With no one looking around, I'm just going to lead you into a time of prayer. All you need to do is to follow me word for word and line by line. And all I need to do as you pray, I want you to mean it with all your heart. I'm going to pray right now and I just want you to just follow after me. And the rest of us here in Teens Excite, let's just repeat it as loud as we can, alright? I'm going to say, I'm going to pray right now. Friends, just follow me. Dear Lord Jesus, Dear Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I believe that you have died on the cross for me. I believe that you have died on the cross for me. And I believe that you have cleansed me of my sins. And I believe that you have cleansed me of my sins. And I confess today. And I confess today that you are my Lord. That you are my Lord. And my Savior. And my Savior. And today, and Lord to- Jesus. And today, Lord Jesus. I want to come into your kingdom. I want to come into your kingdom. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For giving me eternal life. For giving me eternal life. With all eyes closed and all heads bowed, if no one looking around, and friends, if that's who you are, if you have said that prayer with me for the very first time and you mean it with all your heart, and maybe you have said it in your heart, maybe you have said it in your mind, or, or, or maybe you have, you just want to receive Jesus in your life and you want to enter into this kingdom. And at the count of three, I want you to put up your hands wherever you are. And when you put up your hands, you're just telling me, Pastor Kwan Han, can you pray for me? Help me to understand this kingdom. Help me to, to know what it means to, to believe in Jesus. And if that's who you are, at the count of three, I want you to put up your hands. I want to pray a special blessing for you. I'm going to count to three right now. One, two, three. Put up hands right now, wherever you are. Put up hands. As I see your hands over there, brother, I see your hands over there, friend, and over there as well. Father, I just want to give thanks for my friends who have said this prayer together with me to receive you into their lives. Father, I just want to declare in the name of Jesus that today they are your children, and today, Lord, they have entered into the kingdom of God. And I ask that, Lord, that you will just uh, continue to help them to know more about who you really are in their lives. And I declare, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that that you will just uh, show them the reality of the kingdom of God in their lives as well. So, Lord, we commit them in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Can we just stand up and just clap unto the Lord? And just thank Him for what He has done today. Come on, let's just clap unto the Lord. Woo! And this is what I'm going to do. You know, friends, if you have said that prayer with me and you have lifted up your hands, you know, at the count of three, I just want you to just come up to the front and just bring your belongings as well because we want to know who you are and we want to pray for you and because we are serious about helping you to walk with God, alright? And, and friends, even if you have not... Re- Lift up your hands and if you really want to receive Jesus, you can walk up to the friends, to, to the front as well. And 
Things excite your brother, friend. Why don't you just turn to your friend and ask if you want to receive Jesus and ask him to walk up together with you. Okay? And friends who have received, made a decision last week at Spotify, you can come up to the front as well because we want to connect with you personally. I'm going to count to three right now and all the rest of us will just welcome them. One, two, three. Come on. Dear friends, we just want to welcome you. Woo! Thank you, Lord. Just come up to the front. All right. Who's the friend? Hi, what's the name? Han Sing. Han Sing. Can we say hi to Han Sing? Hi, Han Sing. Okay, we just want to pray for you. And I want you to know that when you receive Jesus Christ in your life, okay, it's, it's going to be exciting. And, and as I believe, you know, the, the cell leader here and the friends who have brought you here, they'll help, help you to understand who is Jesus and how to walk with Him. All right? And, and, and we want to pray for you. And please do give us an opportunity to connect with you. And Jasper will connect with you later on so that we can help you you know, in this journey, alright? So can we just stretch forth our hands and just uh, pray for Hansin? Hansin, you can just close your eyes. If you're not comfortable, you can just open your eyes as well. We just want to pray for you. Father, we want to give thanks for Hansin that, that Lord, that he has walked forward, Lord, to, to indicate that he wants to enter the kingdom of God. And Lord, I declare, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that Lord, that you give him peace right now. That peace that transcends all understanding. And I know that he's receiving it right now. And I ask that Lord, that as he connects with with the people here, uh, with the cell leaders, with the, the people in the cell, with Jasper, I ask that, Lord, that you help him to understand what it means, Lord, to walk with you. So, Lord, we want to come in with your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say, Amen, Amen. Woo! Okay, Hansing, can you just follow Jasper to outside? You know, if friends, if you have said that prayer and if you are shy to come forward, you know, cell leaders and, 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 and teens excite. You know, just bring your friends even to the consolidation room where Jasper will be as well. Alright? And today, before we, before we come to the table of the Lord, I think we need to respond to the Lord this afternoon. I just want to read a passage of scripture from Luke chapter 4, verse 18 to 19. It says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. You know, I want you to know this. The anointing of the Lord is upon you. The Lord has set you apart already to be used to build His kingdom here on earth. Not just going out to bring your friends into the kingdom of God, just, just helping them to know God and, and, and be healed of their brokenness. But this passage also says that if God wants to use you wherever you are, in your family, in your schools. And today we need to respond. And if you want to effect change in the nations, or he, has to, he has to start now. He has to start at the place where God has placed you. And today, if that's who you are, you want to be used by God, I want you to respond later on. And the second group of people, stubborn. You know that you refuse to listen to anyone. Why don't you come forward and say, God, help me to change the way that I'm thinking. Help me to renew my mind. Help me to know your ways for my life. But I want you to know this. Why don't you turn your stubbornness around? Why don't you be stubborn in your belief, in your faith in Jesus? Why don't you be stubborn about that? And the third group of people is this. You are desiring to see a personal breakthrough in your life and you know that you keep wanting to say but you feel very discouraged 
But the Lord wants you to respond because He wants to minister to you. Do not be discouraged because He wants to change you. And even as Jason just leads us in this, so let's just respond to the Lord, to, this, to the message. As Jesus, we give thanks for your presence here. And Lord, just sense your sweet presence here among us. Lord, come and just minister to us. We thank you for your love for us in this afternoon. And things excite. And right now, we are entering into a very sacred moment of our worship service where we come to the table of the Lord. And as we come to the table of the Lord, we see the bread that represents the body of Jesus that was broken for us. And we see the cup that represents the blood that was shed for us even on the cross. And you know, as we come to the table of the Lord, let's remember that the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus paved the way for us to enter into His kingdom. And the Lord Jesus, on the night He was betrayed, took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. Can I just invite every one of us to just kneel down if you can. And if you are a visitor, if you are, just a, you are not a believer, you just you can just sit down where, wherever you are and just observe. And if you do not have an, the elements, can you just, the servers will just go to you. You know, as we kneel before the Lord and just preparing the elements in our hands, you know, as you peel off the first layer, you know, the bread that's your, that you're holding in one of your hand, it represents the body of Jesus Christ. And as you peel out the second layer, it reveals the juice, which represents the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross for each one of us. You know, in, in the Bible, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 onwards, it says, So then, whoever drink, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. And right now, I just want to give you a minute, just before the Lord. You know, if you, you know that in your own personal life, there are ways that you know that, that you displease Him, that the way that you live your life does not honour the King. Why don't you just come before Him and just say that, God, please forgive me. And even as you do that, Recommit yourself to the Lord and say, Lord, renew my mind. Help me to realign my life to the kingdom of God. And help me to live in your loving and sovereign rule in this kingdom.
Lord, we give thanks for the bread that's before us. Lord, we thank you that your body was broken so that we can be healed. Lord, we give thanks that, Lord, it's really because of what you have done for us. Lord, that we can receive healing, that we can receive joy, we can receive peace. And Lord, we want to ask that, Lord, that we continue, Lord, to live according, Lord, to what you have called us to in your kingdom. Thank you, Lord. And the Lord says to us, as we hold on to the bread, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Can we partake of the bread right now together? Lord, we give thanks for what you have done for us on the cross. Thank you for the cup that represents the blood that was shed for us on the cross, that our sins can be forgiven. That because of, of your blood that was shed, that we can enter into the kingdom of God and away from the kingdom of darkness. So Lord, we give thanks for the blood that was shed for us. And the Lord says to us, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Can we partake of the cup right now together? Hallelujah. Lord, we give thanks. Lord, for your for your rule and reign over our lives. Lord, we give thanks that we can enter into the kingdom of God. Lord, we give thanks because of the crucifixion, Lord, of, of you on the cross and, and the resurrection of, of you, Lord. Lord, that we can live as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. That, Lord, that we can become your children. Thank you, Lord. We give thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we just stand up and just begin to just praise the Lord and just worship Him and all this time declaring that, that, that He is King of our lives. Praise Him, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Can you just, can you just lift up your hands? just want to pray for you as we leave this place. Father, we just want to give thanks that Lord for speaking to us this afternoon. Lord, we thank you for saving us so that you can work through us Lord on earth to build your kingdom. And Lord, we thank you Lord that the church does not exist for heaven but the church exists for earth. And I declare Lord in the name of Jesus as we stand before you Lord, we want to say to you that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, come. Lord, we desire to see your kingdom being established in our personal lives, Lord, in our families, in our schools, in our church, in our nation, in the nations beyond. So Lord, we want to commit ourselves afresh to you that, Lord, we give thanks for what you have done for us. Lord, help us, Lord, and, and empower us, Lord, so that, Lord, that we can be used by you powerfully to establish the kingdom of God on earth. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we just thank the Lord one more time? Amen. Hallelujah.